Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Wu University event. This is the third part of our glaucoma series, and we're very, very fortunate to have a very well-known speaker in the glaucoma sector. My name is Dr. Stephanie Wu, and I am the founder of Wu University and the host for this evening. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Murray Fingerette. Dr. Fingerette is a clinical professor at the State University of New York College of Optometry, and he was chief of the Optometry optometry section, Brooklyn St. Albans campus, uh, Department of Veterans Administration, New York Harbor Healthcare System from 1983 until 2020. Dr. Fingerette was inducted into the National Optometry Hall of Fame in 2019, and he sits on the board of directors of the Glaucoma Foundation. He is also a founding member and past president of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and he is the recipient of numerous teaching and service awards from the American Academy of Optometry. Uh, Dr. Fingerette is one of the most well-known speakers in glaucoma. I have personally sat in on many of his lectures. I'm actually going to a meeting that he's planning at the end of December in, in uh, California, which I'm really excited about. So you guys are in for a real treat to hear from such a well-respected and amazing speaker. And thanks so much, Dr. Fingeret, for joining us tonight. Well, Stephanie, thank you. Uh, what, a, what a nice uh, introduction. Um, yeah, it, so it is great to be here. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Murray Fingeret. I am from New York. And this is just a listing of my disclosures. Please take a look uh, as I get started. And the topic of this um, talk is new ideas in glaucoma. And there's a lot of things occurring in glaucoma that I would like to, to get to. It, it's an exciting area, the, uh, whether for, from technologies, diagnostic devices, right on to, to uh, new medications, uh, surgeries, how we use surgeries, it's, uh, th th there's a lot, lot changing uh, very quickly. So, you know, the first thing I want to just you know, touch upon is, is intraocular pressure. Intra intraocular pressure is something that we, um, you know, we never really thought about it much uh, you know, for, for years and years. Uh, the, the whole idea of just measuring the pressure using the Goldman or some other device and yet now, as I'll talk about, there is a resurgence in measuring the IOP over a 24 hour period. And there are now uh, some devices that are FDA approved to measure IOP over a, a, over a period. And there are other devices, as I'll discuss, that, are, uh, that have been approved, have a CE mark in, in Europe and are going F, undergoing US uh, FDA approval now. Another thing I'll touch upon is this whole concept of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a way to use uh, the, the, an instrument's data set after it was, uh, as it's been developed, to start to make some important diagnostic decisions with, with a high degree of certainty. We have not, for, you know, for most space, have any uh, have, have AI yet, but it's coming and coming very quickly. And while there is one camera that allows us to, uh, to detect diabetic retinopathy, in many ways, that's the tip of the iceberg. How it's gonna change how we use our OCTs and fields and photographs to diagnose and manage glaucoma, um, we're just waiting to see in that the, uh, the AI software will require approval by the FDA. Um, one of the exciting areas is what has been termed precision medicine. Uh, and there's a nationwide precision medicine initiative. And this was launched by President Obama in 2015 with the idea that it's gonna use science to enhance care. That's using genetics, proteomics, and technologies to improve both the diagnostic and therapy. And you'll hear more and more about it. Genetics is an important area. You know, glaucoma is viewed as a complex genetic disease. In other words, it's not just a single gene. 
there's multiple genes and, and, and they're influenced in different ways. Uh, and that's why it's not just enough to, to find one gene, but you know, there, are, there, are, there may be several genes. Um, and family history, we know plays an important role, especially in terms of the screening process. For example, if you, uh, if you diagnose somebody with glaucoma, it's important to, uh, to tell them to, to, you know, that they should alert their family members um, because they're at risk too. That, you know, that's part of the genetic um, information, but that's, that, that's just starting the process. Genetic testing may one day be important, but that day is coming very quickly. We now know or now have identified at least 100 genes that either cause a glaucoma or elevated IOP. And there are, you know, there are more you know, being identified on a monthly basis. You know, we, we know that 40% of newly diagnosed glaucomas have, our, have a first degree relative. Um, and the question though is sorting out the, the genetics and the genetics at, in part is gonna be for a diagnosis, but down the road and that road is not too far away, gonna be able to take a swab, uh, uh, just have somebody spit and that to the uh, type and the type will not just tell us what diseases the person's at risk for, but also allows a, allow us to understand what's the best medication for that person. For example, you know, a company like 23andMe already does genetic testing, though nothing specific for glaucoma. Another company that's that's new is doing testing Avagen for keratoconus, but they you know they may have some glaucoma testing over the next few years. Understanding our patient's intraocular pressure over 24 hours is really important. That's going to allow us to precisely modulate therapy. We've never you know, been able to know that information before. There are times of the day when the IOP pressure is higher. Um, and I, IOP tends to be highest during the nocturnal hours, um, not you know, early in the morning, but actually while the person's sleeping. But that information is, you know, how we utilize that information, we're still trying to figure out. IOP currently is monitored in the office using isolated daytime measurements. You know, we measure it once here, we measure it again four, three, four, six months later. Um, and, but that may not be enough. And, you know, we've been basing these treatment decisions on these single IOP readings, and yet, we know that the eye pressures can vary quite a bit. They can fluctuate throughout the day and night. In addition, they can vary both in the short term, day to day, and the long term, months to years. Um, and recognizing that IOP is the primary modifiable risk factor has led to a different ways to capture diurnal and nocturnal IOP. This is a paper that goes back to 1998. It was the start of understanding how IOP varies and the fact that IOP is highest during the nocturnal hours. This is done by John Liu and it's out of the University of California, San Diego group. And it, it was just you know, back over 20 years ago, uh, John uh, Liu along with uh, Bob Weinrab uh, started looking into measuring 24-hour IOPs. They used the, uh, the sleep lab as part of the University of California, San Diego. They used night vision goggles um, to, while, to measure IOP while somebody was sleeping. So the person would be in the room, they would use a pneumotonometer, they'd be in the bedroom asleep and they would you know, wake them up uh, briefly, measure their IOP during those night, the darker nighttime hours. During the day, they would measure them at a, at a Goldman, uh, at a slit lamp with a Goldman tonometer. And it was for there that started to realize or recognize that the IOP is actually highest during the nocturnal hours. Well, the sophistication of IO, understanding the IOP has improved dramatically since then. Um, and now, as I'll show you, there is an implantable IOP monitor uh, that is done or implanted as part of cataract surgery, and it's undergoing a fast track 
FDA review right now, it's, as I mentioned, it's already been, uh, been approved with a CE mark in Europe. The significance is all of a sudden we're, we're starting to understand the different, how IOP varies. And for example, this one particular paper that was published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology last year um, confirms that there are seasonal variations of IOP. IOP was higher, um, you know, in during the, uh, when, when the winter than the summer, IOP was lower on, fr uh, on Fridays and other days. And here's the example of some of their, some of their data. And if, you know, and this may have clinical implications. For example, there's a one millimeter difference between if the eye pressure was measured on a, on a Friday from a Wednesday. Um, could that be why at times you may say uh, uh, your patient you know, appears not to be controlled or it's a little higher? You know, these are things we never realized until we now are having these thousands and thousands of measurements using this implantable monitor. And this is even more interesting. Look at the mean IOP in March. 19, median was 19.56 and look at it in July. There's a two millimeter swing there, just month to month. The exact reason why, not quite clear is it related to temperatures or you know, you know, what is, what's going on, but it's, it's fascinating that there's a lot more going on with IOP and some of this is going to be having a, uh, a um, clinical implications, but still trying to figure out or sort it all out. So we're really learning a lot about IOP. The spikes often occur in IOP outside of office hours. About two thirds of, of, of all the spikes occur when we're not seeing patients and missing the peak may lead to misdiagnosis. And we say to our patient is low tension glaucoma, the pressure's 19, and yet it may be 29, just you know, six hours, eight hours later. So there are a whole bunch of reasons why the IOP fluctuates and we're still, you know, still trying to figure out and understand what that is. But patient specific data, that's done outside of the office is a powerful tool in treatment and decision-making for other chronic conditions. And the example being cardiovascular medicine in which they use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring at times for individuals who have, you know, have getting worse or, or have had certain conditions and yet their blood pressure didn't appear to be elevated or may have been that it got, became low. But so out of office, uh, home monitoring is going to be a, uh, a major way that we monitor glaucoma uh, going forward to understand the amplitude and the frequency of these IOP fluctuations. Home tonometry, which will go up beyond not just having an implanted uh, monitor, but as I'll talk about, there are other ways to, to measure IOP that the patient can do, may also be useful in telemedicine, minimize office visits. So we're, we're learning more and more about it. You know, the IOP can vary quite a bit during the day, you know, and can we measure it during, you know, when the patient's not in, the, in our office? And as I mentioned, two thirds of the peak IOP fall outside. Well, there are a couple of different ways or approaches. We have self tonometry and the eye care uh, can do that. We have permanent continuous IOP and that's the implant data I made that can do this. And then we have temporary uh, continuous IOP, and that's a sensimid trigger fish. I'll show a picture of that. That's a device that is FDA approved, though it has, um, it's, it's never been uh, commercially available in the United States. So that was, a, the sensimid was approved uh, in 2016, but there were challenges in terms of the patient use and reimbursement which is why it's just never been available here. The rebound tonometer, you know, most people are familiar with the eye care tonometer. Well, the home eye care tonometer is, is a revised uh, version of the, of the uh, larger eye care tonometer. Um, and it's a great way to, uh, to, as an adjunct for the patient to use at home. Um, and, and patients do do pretty well after a short training session. 
the role of home monitoring is to, def is to detect IOP variations despite in-office measurements that are consistently at the target uh, goal. Um, so self-tonometry is important and that's the, that's the eye care tonometer. And here's a picture of it. And there are several companies uh, that will work with you um, that to lease this device to, uh, to, uh, to a patient and they'll go through the videos and you, know, you can just write a, a prescription for this and then they'll follow up from there. Um, so so that, 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 it, that is available. Um, and um, so the, the home eye care is, 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 one way, is one way to do this. Um, there's another device called, as I mentioned, the Triggerfish, in which it's a disposable soft silicone lens embedded with a microsensor uh, that uh, captures the changes in the cornea the cornea curvature using the strain gauge and the gauge continually monitors the shape of the cornea. It's, um, so it's, it's really measuring ocular volume change, not true IOP. And this is what the contact lens, this is what it looks like with the antenna. It's, um, it, it, uh, it's somewhat cumbersome to, to get the IO, to get the IOP. And it's still very much a, a work in progress. You know, in, in my mind, the most, you know, in addition to the home eye care, the other, you know, in really important uh, IOP monitoring device is going to be uh, the permanent uh, device that's implanted at the time of cataract surgery that, that will provide uh, never ending I, IOP measurements. And it's, it's implanted right in front of the, uh, the new IOL at the time of cataract surgery. And in the top left, you can see, you know, the, uh, you know, what they, you know, what they look at. It's done, as I said, cataract surgery. And then it's, when it's implanted, you really can't even tell that, that it is in the eye and, it, and using a, an induction device it will then via the cloud uh, send IOP measurements back to the, uh, the doctor. And it provides you know, continuous measurements over a 24 hour day. And it's this device that has allowed uh, one to understand, uh, for example, how the IOP varies as I showed you, you know, day of the week or, or month to month. So, so this whole area is, is of, of IOP monitoring is really, really exciting. The next area of, of excitement has to do with artificial intelligence. So this, go, this is going to be software that is going to be uh, used or added as part of the anal software analysis with whether it's a visual field or an OCT or, or, or a fundus camera taking uh, pictures. And the question is, can a computer surpass a clinician in regards to diagnosing glaucoma or recognizing if glaucoma is getting, getting worse? And artificial intelligence you know, can recognize patterns. Um, right now, there are apps on the iPhone that can allow uh, one to, uh, uh, to detect skin cancers. Initially, computers, when AI was first being developed, used pattern recognition with key features programmed in. Um, and that was just somewhat limited in terms of how well the AI software could, you know, can be in terms of prediction of diseases. Now, you allow the, the computer just to go through the so-called training set, which is typically thousands and thousands. It could be images, pictures, visual fields. Um, for them to start to make links or understand, you know, what are the, the common features. And then from there, can you use a, a training set um, to see how well it performs. And then it's from there that it is tweaked. Um, so it's a simulation of human intelligence. And over the next couple of years, this is going to be crucial and it's going to be huge in terms of uh, how we use our diagnostic devices as it combines these large amounts of data. Uh, and it uses what's called the neural network. That's a processing unit 
that's inspired by the way the brain processes information um, consists of many interconnected uh, units like neurons suitably trained to solve specific tasks. It's the computer, as I said, is going to identify key features statistically um, based upon these large data sets. So this is one of the first papers that came out on this. Um, and then this paper uh, goes back, uh, you know, several years ago, and it's looking at diabetic retinopathy. And the question was, how does the performance of an automated deep learning algorithm compare with the manual grading by ophthalmologists for identifying diabetic retinopathy in retinal photographs? And they had, you know, so the training set was, the, was just all under 10,000 images. And then they used a, a, a test set of 1,748 images. And the algorithm had a 90% uh, sensitivity, 87, uh, well, they had a 90% sensitivity when the specificity was set at 98%. So in other words, if you didn't want to overcall, um, and then it, it, could go, it, it would vary 87% with a 98%. Um, specificity, but an operating point selected for high sensitivity of 97.5%, um, you can have a, a specificity of just under of about 93%. So, you know, I, the, the, the point is that these deep learning algorithms had high sensitivity and specificity for detecting diabetic retinopathy. And that was the start of, of this whole thing. Um, well, one of the first papers but detecting diabetic retinopathy, and this, you know, was, you know, you know, in many ways, uh, an easier task for AI because, you know, looking for changes in color uh, on the, on a background, on a picture. Um, but this other next paper that was in nature and biomedical engineering, which is a really a very fine um, journal. This is one of the top scientific journals in the world. Um, this is where most people really stood up um, and took notice. Traditionally, medical discoveries are made by observing associations, making hypotheses, um, and running experiments. However, with medical images, observing and quantifying associations can often be difficult because of wide variety of features, patterns, colors, values, and shape. Here, uh, one shows that deep learning can extract new knowledge from retinal fund fundus images, images. Using deep learning models trained on data, if in this case I had 284,000 patients and validated on two independent data sets, predicted cardiovascular risk factors not previously thought to be present. So this gives you an idea. They showed pictures that this, uh, that uh, with AI, and was able to predict within a year and a half of the person's age. Could almost always predict the gender of the person, if they were a smoker or not. If they had diabetes, it actually can predict their A1C, can predict their body mass and their blood pressures. You know, I mean, it could be within a half a point of the actual systolic. Um, and uh, the diastolic was, was, you know, was, wasn't quite that on. It was about eight, within eight points. But you know, this goes back, just, just starts to show you that there's information in photographs that you know, we, never, you know, we never knew was there. I mean, fascinating, the idea that can, you know, a, a, a picture contains information about gender, body mass, incredible. So let's just show what it can do for, uh, for glaucoma. So this is a paper out of the Duke University group uh, and uh, Felipe Medeiros is one of, the authors, uh, one of the authors and Dr. Medeiros, uh, this is from Duke and Dr. Medeiros last week was at was in Boston at the Academy of Optometry speaking, as well as the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and they're using um, they train a deep learning algorithm that quantifies glaucoma as neuro neuroretinal rim damage. But in this case, 
It's based on fundus photographs using minimum rim width to brook membrane opening from OCTs as part of this training set. Um, and what they're able to do, and this, this is, uh, you know, this is just an example where uh, the, these pictures are able to predict the rim thickness. And you can just look at these and see how incredibly accurate it's able to predict the rim thickness. It also could predict nerve fiber layer thickness. So it, um, you know, it, uh, in another paper, they talked about that. So it's, it, it, it's, it's really very, um, it's amazing how well these devices and the AR is able to go. Um, and there are a host of different AI programs. You know, I don't have time to really to go into it. Um, I do, you know, I, I do a, a whole hour lecture just on AI, but there's OCTs. There are ways of these devices that can train to tell if the angle is closed or how closed. Um, you just need a good image. So that's where this is all going. And it's you know, the... The roadblock to this is that the FDA needs to improve these devices, and that approval um, takes a little while because uh, of what want to make sure that they're doing what they want to do. Um, this is a list of uh, as of last as of the middle of 2019, the uh, the different programs or software, I should say, that are AI approved and. In, in addition to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the diabetic camera, there are some actually a couple of things that are approved for the Apple Watch in terms of uh, a, you know, detection of AFib. Um, there's uh, an ECG feature for, uh, for, the, for the watch, but there are a host of other things that are, and these are all coming down. Um, you know, sooner and sooner. So we're, you know, we're looking at these things very quickly. Another area of, of just that will be exciting when it comes around are these home virtual reality goggles for visual field uh, testing. There are several companies that are now selling them. And, you know, one of the things that's not clear for me is, is you know, what their FDA approval, because they appear they're FDA approved. Um, VR goggles have a limitation and that's within the dynamic range. So, you know, I'm not sure if they can really cover the entire gamut of glaucomatous uh, field defects. Um, but the, you know, one of the uses of this is going to be, especially, the, you know, the concept of home testing that patients, you know, can, can do it at home and uh, do their own tests more often. Um, and, and, and provide automated type of, of testing. So this VR field testing in my mind is, is just beginning and it'll be great to see this whole field um, develop, which one, you know, one day, and that day I don't believe is today, but one day it may become a very useful way for us to, uh, to measure visual fields. So let me move on to talk about glaucoma therapy um, and what's new and the new ideas here. Well, glaucoma is a chronic disease that can be difficult control. Treatment requires multiple medicines and surgeries are often over a per person's lifetime. The treatment endpoints at times are poorly defined. The pressure bobs along and it may be 13 one day, 17 another. Is that okay? Um, uh, you know, medication adherence is a huge challenge. And I'll be talking about drug delivery devices. And one of the reasons why um, there is the challenge uh, and these drug delivery devices are being developed is that it pay, you know, at least half of all patients, if not more, just you know, don't even come close to taking their medications as directed, which leads to this whole continuing need for new therapies and drug delivery devices. So as we look at uh, this slide, there's a lot of yellow in, in there just for some important concepts. Um, generics are with us. I mean, we're not going to be going away from generics. Um, 
you know, they, they make up the huge part of, of, of what we're involved with. Well, more than 70%, for example, of all prostaglandins are generics. Um, you know, I think clinicians have a love-hate relationship with them. Um, you know, we just got to make do as best we can as we try to sort out our patients, um, you know, what medications they can have uh, based on, on their insurance coverage. Do, do glaucoma medications work around the clock? You know, one of the things that most people are not aware of is that as part of the approval process for medication, the FDA is not required 24 hour testing that the, you know, most studies, you know, the, the IOP is, is measured three times between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. That's it. And, you know, and it's why for years never realized that two important medications we use, Timolol and Bromonidine, don't work around the clock. They have all, they're doing, they, they have no impact upon lowering IOP during the hours when a person's sleeping. We are now in this era of fixed combination agents, and a fixed combination is is a is a bottle that has two medications in it. You know, the first was Cosop, which was Timolol and Tozolamide. Um, you know, we have Combigan, uh, which is uh, the the combination of bromonidine and, and, and Timolol. We have Simbrenza, we have Rocklitan, which is the newest fixed combination of Lantanoprost and uh, the Tarsidil. So we have these fixed combinations, and in many ways, they've moved up to second-line agents. What I mean is that often, you know, not Rocklitan, but often somebody is on, for example, a prostaglandin, then a, then a doctor may go and put in, start the patient if they need another medicine on a fixed combination, which has two medicines in it, as compared to running the single uh, agents in. And that, that's just where we are. Um, you know, the uh, corner for simplicity. Another new, new feature is the fact that SLT, um, while we've always known it's a, it can be a first line agent, um, it, it was never clear how well it would, um, how well it would perform if used as a primary uh, therapy. And there was a study done in the United Kingdom a couple of years back called the LIGHT study, laser glaucoma and ocular hypertensive trial that showed that if SLT, if done before medicine, so the first modality works very well and works a little better than medications. We are now in the era of glaucoma surgical devices for glaucoma patients, not ocular hypertension. You know, we have the hydras, the eye stent inject. These are the MIGS devices. And just those MIGS devices account for, you know, a great portion of, of uh, Medicare surgical costs. And recently there was uh, for 2022 when the Medicare uh, uh, reimbursements came out, um, there was a, an adjustment to this and that instead of $325 for 2022, the surgeon fee is going to be $134, which is a major um, you know, reduction in fees. And it will be interesting to see if that has any impact upon how many uh, MIGS devices are being inserted. Um, because they are for cataract surgery and they're done, you know, most of the time with cataract surgery. Um, you know, for somebody who has glaucoma, you know, most glaucoma patients who have cataract surgery will have the MIGS device uh, implanted. We do have some you know, relatively new medications, lantanoprostine bonoi, Fisolta, Natarsidil, Ropressa, and Natarsidil, lantanoprostol, Roclitan are now with us. And, and these are medications, whether it's the Rokinase or the Nicox lantanoprostine, they enhance trabecular mesh work outflow. Um, something that pilocarpine did years ago. And now, um, we're, we're back doing this again. So, you know, for example, the nitric oxide, this, you know, improves trabecular mesh work outflow. And while the prostaglandins work on UV sclero outflow. And then we have new, newly approved drug delivery devices. We have, you know, that's, you know, years ago, um, you know, 
1975, uh, there, there was a, a drug delivery device, the Ocusert, that was, a, a, it looked like a half a contact lens put under the cold N3 um, lid that had pilocarpine in it. Um, been around for a long time, no longer available, but that was actually an FDA approved drug delivery. And yet, Vice and then we never had anything, at least for glaucoma, up until recently with now Darista. And I'll show a picture of that in just a second. But this is a small implant inserted into the anterior chamber with bromatoprost. Um, and the impudence is again um, the uh, patient adherence. Uh, and in, in, which is often a roadblock to successful glaucoma therapy. Um, neuroprotection is, an, is another area we are still talking about. Hopefully one day we will see this and it'll be with us. Um, there are a lot of companies, a lot of people uh, working in this area. So in the future, like cardiologists, we may discuss with our patients, not just lowering the IOP, by medicines, but we may talk about them altering your diet, weight loss, increased physical activity, even though right now there's not a lot of proof that these make sense or, or they would work. I mean, you know, we, we you know, in, 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 for example, smoking cigarettes, it's a strange one in that you would think that this would be deleterious to uh, a person's glaucoma. And we know it's deleterious to their health, and yet there's scant evidence that cigarette smoking uh, is harmful for glaucoma. And it may be due to the nicotine or the nicotinamide, which may even be a neuroprotective substance. Um, there is a host of evidence about meditation, and meditation have done in you know with the done uh, and the studies you know, did it for uh, three weeks, 45 minutes a day, and that can lower the IOP as well as a medication. Um, but most of the new therapies revolve around surgical devices with reducing complications at com as compared to the standard uh, filtration surgery or drug delivery devices. And there are many drug delivery devices, not just the Darista, but there are devices looking for punctal plugs, contact lenses, um, uh, misting on the eye, um, uh, rings around the eye. So there, there are, uh, you know, several ways that, uh, that this is, uh, that we're going to be seeing um, these delivery devices come to us going forward. As I mentioned, generics, and in this case, generic lantanoprost that you know, came in 2011 has significantly altered the uh, the, the, the landscape, um, you know, we now, uh, you know, often need to start with a generic and then, you know, and then try to go to a branded agent uh, after that. Um, it's just the hurdles for reimbursement. The, um, you know, and then we often, you know, try to get the, uh, these non-formular agents uh, prior off approved but you know, there are hurdles and there are hurdles for reimbursement. Um, Imprimis, for example, is a compounding pharmacy to, you know, and you know, when the, these agents are made um, with uh, typically without preservatives and there are agents that uh, bottles that can have, you know, lantanoprost and uh, bromonidine and, and dorzolamide, um, you, know, and, you know, in it, uh, um, and dorsolamide. So you can have medications, can have two, three, four medications in a bottle, typically still using only once a day, which is always a strange way considering some of these medications probably don't have that long a half-life. Um, you know, these medicate, you know, you know, there's absolutely no evidence I'm aware of that these medications are effective as you would expect for multiple medications but they're being used more and more and more, you know, by, by our patients. Um, I've, I've discussed the, the arrival of MIGS and MIGS has changed um, the landscape also really pretty, uh, you know, pretty dramatically, um, especially with the eye stent. The Zen is doesn't, you know, can is done more for advanced glaucoma 
procedures, but the I stand and inject, uh, I stand inject and hydrus are really, um, you know, being used, as I said, more and more and more. So there are currently, you know, six classes of IOP lowering medicines um, that we try to use to different extent, um, uh, with typically starting with a prostaglandin and then going to, uh, um, but you know, nowadays we also will, you know, may start with SLT and only go to a medication if, if need be. You know, part of the newest area has to do with this, you know, going medications that work on the trabecular meshwork. Very exciting. You know, that's in Tarsadil, Visolta, in that this provides lowering, um, especially at the site of outflow impairment, the trabecular meshwork. And for the, the Tarsadil, what's unique about this is that it also enhances episcleral venous pressure, which is the back pressure, um, to the eye. So it can lower ILP uh, even more than we ever previously thought. It's why we're able to, we see with people are on the tarsidils, just these, these really significant IOP reductions. Um, the tarsidil does have some baggage and that's the hyperemia in particular. Um, and you just have to explain to patients that uh, most eyes are going to get, you know, you know, somewhat red and patients just, you know, you know, should expect it, and hopefully a lot of that will dissipate um, over uh, over the time the patient is on the medication. The myotics is the one class of drugs that we use extremely infrequently, and really, uh, it's more of a of a, uh, of a drug that the glaucoma specialist has held in reserve when they uh, you know had didn't have many other options. Um, it's fascinating that my, myotics, and especially whether it's pilocarpine, uh, are going to be used uh, in just uh, pilo 1.25%, which is approved um, for use for, for pres as a presbyopia drug. This is just a listing to give an idea of the history of glaucoma drugs. So pilocarpine goes back to the 1870s, um, and that's how long it's been around. And we're, you know, it's still around because it's, it's systemically safe and it's effective. Um, it does cause some local side effects. And then the biggest change from there came 1978 with Timolol. And then we had the topical CAIs uh, came out in 1995. Not long after that, Zalatan, Lantanapros came out with Lumigan and Travitan five years later. Um, and then in the last couple of years, we've seen the lantanoprostine like, bunoid and the tarsidil and the tarsidil lantanoprost. So clearly these trends are going to be to uh, in topical eye drop therapeutics. We're talking about compounds with multiple mechanism of action. For example, you know, you think about uh, the tarsidil and it works by uh, both effects on the trabeculum as well as episcleral venous pressure. So these are where these medications are being developed. They, they work on several, several ways. Um, in regards to drug delivery devices, this is one part of the future. And Duresta is the beginning of this. And Duresta is this implant. And you can see what it looks like when it's just inserted. And then over a period of months, and so it's injected into the anterior chamber. It looks like a little pellet. And then over a period of months, it, uh, it resorbs. Um, and usually the medication is gone by about six, uh, six months. It, uh, it's performed in the office. Uh, it's, uh, it falls into the inferior angle. Patients no longer have to worry about taking the, uh, the medication. Um, you know, and it's uh, the, and the the data appears to show that it um, that even though the medication can be gone after six months, medication it, it, it the trabec the uh, uvea sclera is re is somehow remodeled and the effect can last for far longer for a year maybe even longer than that. So the the downside to this though is that. 
Um, right now, the FDA only allows it to be used one time. That's a limitation. That's a real limitation. So, uh, but going forward, uh, the allergen is 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 re is reexamining with another study, and they're petitioning the FDA, and hopefully. We're going to have our patients be able to have this performed more than once. So, what, what what I've tried to do over this 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 time, and we're going to take go back to take some questions, um, is run through what are the new things in glaucoma, uh, and and you know in, in whether diagnostically with AI, <laughs> ILP monitoring devices, or therapeutics are just you know, an amazing amount of changes that we're looking for. So with that, um, let me turn the program over to Dr. Wu. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Fingerette. That was not only a great outline. I, I love even just going through the history of some of the medicines like you did, you know, showing that pilocarpine has been around forever. And it just, it's so interesting just when the different medications kind of came to market and just what, what has changed. And even with the inventions of some of these injectables and, um, and just some of these new MIGS devices. I mean, these were things that just, they haven't even been around for that long. So who knows what the future is going to be uh, with glaucoma. It's, it's very exciting. So we do have a few questions. Uh, first question from Dr. Hain. If 60% of the newly diagnosed glaucoma patients don't have a first degree relative that have been diagnosed that shows that most people do not have a properly qualified OD or that genetics play a very small relationship. Please comment. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think if 40% is, that's a pretty, pretty big relationship. And I think, uh, you know, I mean, the other issue is um, family histories are very, uh, is, is a very, you know, so if you're going to go by the number of people that have a family history, uh, it's misleading because nowadays, I mean, you know, most people don't know uh, what conditions their mother had or their sister, or their brother, if their family members move away. Um, you know, there have been a few studies that have actually, when they diagnosed glaucoma, they went back and they examined uh, every relative that they could, and they found that the you know that the number of people that they diagnose, um, you know, was 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 really significant. So I don't take it like that. I I take it that that forty percent is a huge number, um, but if you don't get a family history, that doesn't mean anything because again, most people don't know. Um, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I mean, how many people know, uh, you know, the, the true health of, uh, of, of their brothers or their mother? And unless, you know, the, and, you know, and that's why I've always made it a point to tell patients that they need to tell all of their relatives that they just were diagnosed. And that's a good point because, you know, how many patients come in and they say, you know, you ask them, does anybody in your family have glaucoma? And they say, Oh yeah, they, they have that. And then they had the surgery that it took it out and now they can see without right. glasses and you're thinking, okay, well, that they're talking about cataract surgery, but you right, know, that exactly. happens every single day. Yeah. That yeah. people get so, confused. So. Yeah, it, so that type of history, it, you know, is, is, is misleading and why, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's difficult. So I, I, you know, I just, I look at it. That's a big number that a small number. That's, that's my opinion. Yeah. Great point. Next question from Dr. Knowles. Would the implantable IOP measuring device be compatible with MRIs? Yes. Yeah. So, so the implantable device, you know, and, and I had to remove a bunch of slides just for the sake of time. But, but this past June, the FDA gave, and you can go to the FDA website and read more about it. But this past June, the FDA gave fast track review to the ILP monitoring device, um, which is significant because there are very few uh, devices that ever get that. So that tells you the how the FDA views this as being significant. Um, and yes, you know they they are. There is no metal in them. They can be uh, used with MRIs. 
Great. Next question from Dr. Minsky. Can you comment on marijuana smoking for reducing IOP? Good question. Um, so, you know, there's, there, there's, a, there's no doubt that marijuana smoking lowers the IOP. I mean, you know, most of the work was done um, 30 years ago, uh, and a lot of it was done at the uh, University of Miami, Paul Palmberg, and then uh, it became difficult to do these studies. The U.S. government put uh, uh, just one lab in Mississippi that uh, would, would enable uh, uh, to actually get, the, you know, legally or from the U.S. government. Um, but, you know, know that marijuana lowers IOP. The kicker, though, it is has a very short half-life. It has a half-life of anywhere from two to four hours. Um, and so a person would, you know, would have to, you know, be, uh, you know, and, and, and would, would be, would, would, you know, and now these studies were done smoking. Um, you know, it, it would be, and everything, even, even with the, the different forms of cannabis now, um, there's no evidence that anybody has figured out how to get a long acting IOP um, uh, the uh, uh, effect to, you know, to, to occur and nobody has figured out a way yet to, uh, to, to dissociate the, uh, the psychoactive psychogenic effects from the IOP reducing. So, you know, people are going to get the high um, along with the, uh, the IOP effects, but it's, it's short, you know, the IOP effects are short acting and that's why it, it limits it, you know, dramatically. Yeah. I remember in school, one of my professors said, yeah, it, it's very effective from what the studies show, but it's, you have to do it all the time. So you'd have to be smoking every two to four hours. And I mean, it's just, and then what do you do at nighttime? And then she's like, I could do, you could prescribe that or you could prescribe one eye drop to use at nighttime and, and, you know, move on and then we'll see you in three months. So that's kind of how she put it. <laughs> yeah. And even the cost, you know, mm -hmm. you start looking at the cost between, uh, yeah. you know, at least for a generic Absolutely. eye drop compared to, uh, you know, I mean, smoking every day, uh, you know, it, uh, it can get very expensive. Absolutely. Uh, next question from Dr. Mendoza. Do you feel like with the Medicare fee reductions, that are set to take place that we will see less MIGs being used and more bang being utilized in its place. You know, so that's the, uh, that's the question. And I'm not sure, you know, so the, um, so one of the strange things about how MIGs are, uh, are, are, are reimbursed is that if they're done in, in, uh, in surgical uh, facilities, there you know there's a reimbursement is is higher than it is done in offices or even in academic settings. And you know, I guess somebody had a better lobbyist when the fees came down. But there are some discrepancies there. I mean, it's uh, it's you know, and I'm not an expert on this, and I don't know, uh, you know. So the answer to it. You know, the question is, I don't know. Before all of this went down on the American Glaucoma Society net, there was a lot of, um, a lot of concern. Um, you know, it was very strange that because this pool of surgical dollars for all of thalamic procedures is not getting larger, that as the MIGS amount of uh, being done with cataract surgery, the eye stents, for example, went up, that was taking the, uh, some of the money away from some other ophthalmic uh, surgical procedures. So um, not everybody was happy with it. And one of the strange things when this, so this reduction with the ROC, RUC, the RUC came out back in June, um, it led to the glaucoma folks protesting and the American Glaucoma Society had to go alone and that the Academy of Ophthalmology, the uh, AICRS, for the first time were not involved in this, uh, 
um, and they actually supported the reduction, which you know made no sense, but tells you the politics of this whole reimbursement issue are complex. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't, you know, my guess is that it, you know, I don't think it's going to, it's, I don't think anything's going to change, but you know, we'll see by, uh, you know, by, by June, July, we'll have a good idea. Great. Uh, another question for Dr. Minsky. Hi, Marie, do you, you ever use Lumify in conjunction with glaucoma medications to try to keep the patient's eyes whiter? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, and I get this a lot and, um, I have not, but I know people who do and swear by it. Um, yeah. so I know people that have been using it, you know, it's kind of interesting, a low dose, you know, so, you know, a low dose of bromonidine does that, but a higher dose may not. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, so I've heard, I have not had experience, but I do know people that have that do this and they speak positively of it. Yeah. Uh, another question, a great question from Dr. Gupta, um, wants to know about the FDA approved studies, Lunar and Apollo, and commenting that the, the studies were underwhelming and wonder if you have found it to be particularly successful relative to just pure latanoprost in any specific subtype of glaucoma. So they're talking about Visalta, I would assume. Um, yes. So, you know, um, the, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, when you look at those studies on face value, the comparison to Timolol, uh, uh, the, the, it's so, so you have to break them apart. Let me go, go back. And I, you know, and while we don't have the, the data in front of us, but let me just say, if you would look at the response of Timolol group, the ILP reduction was about 28%, 29%. I mean, which is crazy. We never see Timolol work that well. And the effect of Isolta was about 32, 33%, if my memory is, is correct. So, the, it, it, you know, right off the bat, if they would just would have just showed the Visolta arm, you would have said this is a great response. Um, you know, and, and for whatever reason, and these studies are, tra are, are, are strange, um, that device, you know, that, that the Timolol group was, was, was excellent responding to, um, and these are relatively short term. And so that difference between the two is not as, uh, is, is, is not as obvious. In the phase two, um, the, uh, the, you know, latinoprostine buno did show just over one millimeter greater ILP reduction than, uh, you know, than latinoprost. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's an important number. And that to me is, you know, is, is, is significant. Um, I, you know, the, there are other issues about Visolta. You know, one is that there is no hyperemia. There's no different than, uh, than Lantanoprost. You know, one of the questions is, is that does it actually uh, improve blood flow? Um, Lou Pasquale, who is a friend of mine here in New York City, has done a host of work showing that this nit nitric oxide molecule can improve, improve blood flow. And the, uh, the, the company Nycox is working on another, um, they're going to have their own that's going to have the Nycox uh, bimatoprost mo uh, molecule, um, you know, in a, in a couple of years. But, you know, I, I mean, I think this blood flow, while they've never really proved it, it's why it's not or, or proved it to the extent that of trials that the FDA would want, um, you know, I mean, this, it, that may also have some, uh, some importance. I'm not sure, but I mean, I think, a, you know, I, I think I like Faisalta. I think Faisalta is, 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 is really a, a good drug, a little, little more effective than a Tonoprost with, with, you know, very little baggage. Great. Well, I think that's all the time we have.